Okay, so yeah, um, let's start. Today, um, I'll first start off with some like, uh, mostly open-ended questions um, about like key ideas, key concepts that you've learned from the book. Um, and then later on, um, we'll have questions about uh, more like the book itself. Um, finally, I'll introduce the next book we're going to be reading, um, The Pursuit of Happiness. And um, everyone will be expected to fill out a spreadsheet um, and like to assign themselves a chapter to make questions for next meeting. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. so I just wanted to start off with some like key open-ended um questions about this book. So first of all, what was a key takeaway you had from this book? And what were you most inspired about? Like a lot of people have a lot of different answers. So um yeah, and since this is an open-ended question, um, I would greatly encourage everyone to like share your ideas. So does anyone want to share? Um, uh, this is Isabella. I shouldn't rename. Um, so I want to share, and basically, I thought, um, this author she mainly talked about her life more than AI, like. It was very different from the AI 2041 book we read. And I thought it was pretty, I was just kind of amazed, like awed that the author fell in love with physics like that quickly. Like, I don't know, but logic is like kind of really hard for me. So that was just pretty cool. And also, um, I think it's cool that she adapted to America really quickly and was able to go to an Ivy League even though she was an immigrant. So, yeah. Yeah, that's true, yeah. This book definitely is um different from AI 2041. And yeah, I guess I would like I was kind of surprised too um that like she um took up physics, like she loved physics at a pretty small age without like any um like by herself um and again yeah um that she quickly adapted to a life as an immigrant I guess that shows a lot of like motivation and stuff oh yeah yeah that's really interesting Isabella I agree with you um, does anyone else want to share oh and can you guys hear me because it says my internet connection is unstable or something um, we can hear you. It's just a bit like, um, cut. Like the audio is kind of choppy. Oh, like glitchy. Oh, so you guys can like make out what I'm saying, right? Um, for the most part, yes. Okay. Well, I don't really know about my internet, but whatever. Anyways, um, okay, does anyone else want to share besides Isabella? Okay, I emphasize this point a lot in like previous reading clubs too, but mainly like a lot of like the points about a reading club isn't just to listen, um, like maybe a class or a lecture maybe, it's also to like participate. Um, like participating can be like answering questions, um, participating in discussions can like greatly enhance like your learning too. And it overall just makes the book club more active, you know? Okay, so anyways, since no one um besides Isabella, oh, oh yeah, Isabella, thanks for sharing. Um since no one currently um is willing to share, I'll share my key takeaways um and things that inspired me the boat the most I had from this book. Um I thought it was really inspiring how like Fei Fei Li, daughter, she um like the 
um, wrote about her main most of her career and the different challenges she had experienced, the different insights um, and things she like invented or or made. So I thought that was really inspiring and it seemed like she made a lot of great contributions to her field. Also, I like that she included like a lot of detailed descriptions of like AI algorithms and AI knowledge instead of instead of like all focusing on herself sometimes um because um it made for also um more like learning about AI too and yeah it was really inspiring to um like read about her career and um different AI inventions etc so Moving on to question number two, what part of the book did you most enjoy reading though? Um, it doesn't have to be about like AI related exactly, although most of the book is AI related. Um, like which part of the book did you most enjoy reading? Um, anyone? Um. I forgot which chapter it's from, um, but I like the part where Fei Fei's um mom, she's talking with her teacher because her teacher thinks Fei Fei reads too many like different books from their curriculum, and then the mom is just like tired of the teacher, and she's like, yeah, I just thought it was kind of funny. Oh yeah, that was funny though. Yeah, that was the first thing that came up to my mind because most parents um they would I mean not most like many um some parents they would definitely like side of the teacher or they would encourage the kid to read um more books about like um specific academics but yeah um that was a really interesting part of the book too yeah um anyone else Audrey Oliver Kai uh hold on who else is in this book Mm, does anyone else want to share? Mm. Okay. Mm. Okay, if no one actually wants to participate, then um I might like con hold on. Okay, then let's move on to question number three, though. Then, um, would you have made different life choices um, than Fei Fei Li, such as deciding to continue being a scientist or researcher, despite more luxurious jo job offers, such as in Wall Street or in McKinsey? Um, and, would you, or, and sticking with ImageNet, not taking up, up another idea, um, instead, choosing to focus on AI research instead of physics. Um, so do you think you could have like persevered through a lot of challenges or like um, made similar life choices? And um, so what interesting, how like, how interesting do you think her um, career is or her life is? Um, do you think you would have made different choices I would uh, take up the job offers because I'm not very good at science and I don't really like researching. Yeah, I can definitely see that though because a lot of the job offers were like, yeah, they um, were pretty big, good jobs, you know, um, with, with lots of like perks and like salaries and stuff. Um, and I guess that different people might choose to be different things. Like not everyone wants to be a scientist or researcher um, and do research all their life on a specific field. But yeah. Yeah. Oh, and thanks for sharing our dream. Mm, does anyone else want to answer this question? Okay, speaking of which, 
does anyone think like they were stuck with um their idea of image net or they would have taken up another idea and said it's okay um like um there's no right or wrong to this question exactly um i just wanted to like know everybody's like um what they would have um did in Fei lee's place mm. okay yeah. Okay then, so um, since um, I see that not many other people um, want to share the ideas, um, let's move on to the next portion of this reading club. So now let's just like um, discuss some questions for each chapter. So question number one, what early experiences shaped um Fei Fei's interest in AI and how did they influence her career path? Um, I think somewhere in the book she talks about how this professor influences her thinking on AI. Um, it's like he said something about all these being curious, always exploring. And I think that's what that influenced her thinking on AI. Oh yeah. Um oh yeah, do you remember which professor it was or like what college or what school? I think it was when she was at Princeton. Um I'm not sure. I'm gonna try and find it. Oh yeah. Okay. That sounds really interesting. Um, when you find it, um, let me know. Um, because I think, yeah, you're right. Um, uh, a lot of professors like shaped her interest in AI too. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to know like which professor exactly you thought um, like was most influential. Does anyone else um want ha want to answer this? question or have a response? No, oh, I found it. It's page 75 and it's where the professor looks at the a photo of Hubble like telescopes stars thing. Oh yeah. Yeah that was um Oh, yeah, 74 and 75. Yeah, I read that too. Yeah, I thought that was very um influential too. I really liked that paragraph. Um, because okay, I wasn't exactly there at the lecture, but it really did like when I thought about it, actually. Um, it really does make you feel um curious. Um, it makes it encourages you, yeah. I suppose that was um, one influential person um, that shaped her interest in AI. Does anyone else have a response? Okay. So, um, in my opinion, um, among all, a lot of other things, I think um, some early experiences that shaped her interest in AI um, or when like her parents encouraged her to like read, be curious, explore um different things. And again, she was interested in physics, right? Um, but she mainly she was just interested in the way like how things work, um, and then she, how things like run in the world. And then and then that developed into a passion in AI, or like how the brain worked and how to replicate that in machines. Yeah, I think a lot of um, influential AI researchers, they actually started a career in physics or another rather similar field. But yeah. Mm, so question number two, how does um, the author Fei-Fei Li describe the initial goals or workings of AI algorithms? And how have these algorithms evolved over time? In the book, she um do numerous sections. She detailed how the early beginnings of AI evolved to more sophisticated algorithms, um, and better results. So, can you just 
if you want, I can let you take a minute to like skim over the book. But can but if you don't need to, can anyone describe like um how initial like crude AI algorithms um how they worked, how their goals were, and how um these algorithms evolved over time. Hmm. Does anyone have an answer right now? Or do you need to like take a time to look over the book? Okay, does anyone have an answer so far? Or does anyone like remember anything that they read or learned from the book? Okay, speaking of which, so I noticed this too in like other reading clubs. So I would greatly encourage you when you're reading a book to highlight like important sections and then later on um, to like review like key concepts that you highlighted so that you can enhance your learning of the book, right? Because um, it's not enough to just read a book. Um, you should also like know, um, like know like generally what you read. Um, you should gain a lot of knowledge from a book. Uh, so it doesn't matter like if you read a lot of books, you should like, um, be able, you should like learn from each book um, a lot of knowledge um, and what the book was about, etc. So I would greatly encourage you after you've read a book, um, like just go back and like reread it again if you um, forget some stuff um, because what matters is to learn from these books, right? Um, rather than maybe just um, skimming through a book for the purpose of finishing it for a reading club, um, etc. Yeah. Although, of course, I think like, um, I feel like this reading club is, is still um, pretty, like, I definitely seen like everybody like improve in their knowledge in AI, so. Um, well, I went back in the book and I found, um, I remember this part where, um, she was talking about how the, Le, Lacoon, I don't know how to say his name, it's L-E-C-U-N, but she talked about how this person, he, um, basically taught a computer, like, kind of like quantum computing, he taught the computer how to read handwritten digits, and that's kind of like an algorithm, like um, teaching the computer. And now I feel like algorithms have evolved to more complex things, like maybe teaching a, a robot how to do a simple surgery. Like you could feed it thousands of data over a doctor doing that surgery multiple times. Um, and I that's just like the evolvement. Yeah, that's great, Isabella. <coughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Ali Khan, Newton, whatever. Um, he was definitely like a very influential like researcher. Um, I don't think he used quantum computing exactly. Um, he used neural networks to like um um and then like algorithm and ATM machines to like be able to recognize the digits on the checks, checks or anything. So basically neural networks, they're like a type of like deep learning where they're where they um are used to like detect patterns in data. And since there was a lot of data, um you could like easily get access to data of handwriting, like digits. So back 
so those like data was were really common kind of or like, easier to gather so um that was a part of the reason that that um like the current like algorithm worked and um even back then when there was like much less um well, me... hmm? oh does anyone have a question um okay So does anyone else um want have an answer? Okay. So I'll just like give a basic like overview like really quickly. Um so um um like basic AI algorithms like in the old um like older AI algorithms, um back then they used a type of um programming called knowledge engineering in which they would like um input like different rules um or for example if you were if you were trying to get an ai algorithm to generate a piece of text they would input a lot of grammar rules and stuff except then of course they realized um these those um i those algorithms didn't really work um as ai didn't do well with like these like set of rules and when they did it was only narrowed to like a very like specific um field in which they could do something um plus back then there were a lot of like not very much computing power computing power was really rare then not like now when you can just buy something off the shelves of best buy so yeah um very little computing power pretty bad computers back then but over time that's like um computing power and data began to um like be get better um there were more like um machine learning algorithms such as regression um support vector machines as Pepe later described these are still pretty advanced and then and then like these were like after a long period of time um trial and error um and then of course there were then there was the subcategory of machine learning or AI called deep learning, um, which was used up neural networks. Those had been invented earlier, but because of the limited amount of data, they couldn't function very well. Um, so yeah, that became part of a subsection of uh, AI called deep learning, which works really well. Um, okay, so let's skip the part of the early act applications of AI because we're running a little bit short of time so far. Um, so now let's move on to a topic that the book covered a lot. Um, so how does perception of vision occur? How does it work? Like how does biological vision work? This subject was covered like a lot um, in this book. So um, yeah, again, I feel like um, a lot of people might not um, have too much trouble answering this question. So according to the author, how does vision occur? How does it work? Does anyone have an idea? Okay, this um subject was covered like a lot in this book. So um I would like greatly um like, I would greatly encourage, like, anyone who knows the answer to share. Um, well, I know there's, like, the receptors in your eyes and, like, how we humans have, like, three prime colors. Like, um, I think it's red, blue, and then green or yellow. I don't know. Red, blue, and green, I think. But in a more, like, different way to say is that, like, Vision is just like how we interpret light 
and then we use what we interpret to um, combine that with our knowledge. And this author, she had these like German and Italian friends that were asking her like, how would you explain light to some, I mean, vision to someone who's never seen before? And I feel like you can't really describe the color red or something. And I thought that was just a really good topic it bring up and yeah. Yeah, close to the Bella. So yeah, um vision definitely works like you um your eyes like they um see stuff, um color shapes, and then they transmit that into your brain, which processes that, um, and like uses like past experience knowledge. So do you know how that actually like works? Like more specifically, anyone? Mm, okay, so since no one can think of an answer, um, of more like, specific answer, of course, like Isabella already gave us a pretty good answer. Hold on, uh, a pretty good answer. So, um, does anyone have like a slightly more specific example? Okay, <laughs> so more specifically, um. You know, next time we should have a pop quiz after this. After like a club, but okay, whatever. So more specifically, vision occurs like in like a kind of like a hierarchy or like a layer or like different um layers of like um different levels of like layers. So um at the most basic layer or level um are like um like in your eyes or um like different or like in your brains or different um kind of like neurons i guess that um like are in charge of like finding a, a finding um details or like a specific shape line color of one specific portion of an image or an object and then like uh, across like different higher and higher levels, um, these neurons become more complex. Like instead of finding one single line, um, and like, of, instead of um, a layer of neurons finding a single line, a single color, a single shape, they join together into more complex, um, like, more complex higher level um awareness awareness. Um, of now, for example, higher level might have like recognition of like a single like big object or a single big detail, and when you go up and up, that becomes more and more complex until um you can perceive um until you have perceived like a giant complex object, and there in the top layers, um your brain your like knowledge um your knowledge um past experience comes into play uh, like they connect things like they connect with the shapes and lines you seeing into um actual objects mm. so this is actually how um like neural networks work um but we will discuss that um in later Buttons, so later questions. Okay, on to part two. So how do you understand the author's statement? Vision, therefore, is not merely an application of our intelligence. It is, for all practical purposes, synonymous with our intelligence. So how do you understand that? And I I realize like people might have like slightly varying um different ways, like um, of understanding the statement. So how do you understand this? Um, well, I think there's like a simple version where like everything you see 
basically tells you everything you need to know in order to like solve a problem. So for example, if you couldn't see, then if you're walking and there's like an object in front of you, if you couldn't see, you would trip over it. So, but since you can see, you have the intelligence to walk over that object. So therefore you wouldn't trip. Yeah, that's an, um a very uh, that's a nice take on it too. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. Like vision comprises a part of our intelligence. Um, but does anyone else have like another answer, um, to her statement? Okay. So my personal understanding of the statement is that um, vision um, and vision is not like an application or like vision is not something like you see from your eyes, like your organs, and then like it just is. Um, you vision with vision, you have to use your intelligence to like make sense of things. For example, um, these multicolored blobs, lines. Um, angles and stuff without your intelligence and like your um brain like the ideas like um in your brain you cannot you can't turn those random blobs of stuff into actual things you recognize so your intelligence um or like um your intelligence basically also plays a part in vision like it's not enough just to see you have you also have to perceive the thing you are seeing um does anyone get what i'm saying okay uh, moving on to question number two in the book, Fei Fei mentioned the theory that vision works in a hierarchical sense, as I said before, with levels of increasing complexity that each recognizes a specific part of the image. For example, lower levels will recognize like small, tiny little details, but as you move up um through um the hierarchy through the levels, you begin to recognize more and more bigger more complex things and at the top levels like you begin to understand those things like um where you bring your past experience your knowledge your intuition and like you recognize the things that you're seeing um so all this like happens like really fast like it's not like oh um what is this rectangle um with like different lines and shadows um it happens like in a matter of like milliseconds basically very very quickly um so that's the theory right so however some other studies found that people take less time to recognize a large complex scene than to recognize basic shapes for example one study um, recorded the amount of time that a person took to like recognize a a green triangle among red circles, or like a green triangle among uh, green circles. So, um, they recorded the amount of time that um people or participants took to recognize that. But another study um also recorded that people take le even less time to recognize a large complex scene, like a large picture of a, of a detailed kitchen or a house or like a forest. So, so why do people take less time to recognize that than to recognize like basic triangles and circles? So does anyone know? Okay, if no one knows, um, I'm gonna start like calling on people. Um, yeah, Th this is a slightly more like detailed question though. So, it. Mm, let's see. Uh, Audrey, uh, do you want to answer this question?
Okay. Oh, uh, Audrey, are you there? Okay, it's okay if you don't know like um the answer to the question exactly. But um, if you don't know, you can like res like respond, like. Okay, so um Oliver, do you have an answer to this question? This is question three. Wait, what what question do you think we're on? I thought we were on three. um okay so do you know what we were talking about before it's okay if you don't know like you want me to like slow down when i'm explaining something or, like in a discussion or, like reading a question um uh, it's okay you can tell me no it's fine i just wait <laughs> You were mentioning the study thing, which was two. So is it two done now? Okay, as a matter of fact, we are talking about the question number two. Um, in the future, if you don't even know what question you're on, I would greatly suggest, um, like, in fact, I really suggest. I would actually suggest you pay um slightly more attention to the, um the reading club. Um, but yeah, we are on question number two, so I'm assuming you don't know the answer to the question. Mm, okay, I it's can. okay. I can point to something else. So, anyways, um, Kai. Do you want to answer? Oh, and Kai, do you know what question we are on? Okay, so Kai, I'm assuming just like Audrey, um, for some reason your microphone is magically not working, right? Or the fact that some kind of ghost has um for some reason um entered this meeting. What's your name? Okay. Uh, so does anyone else um have have want to answer? Oh, I swear we had seven participants. Why do we only have six now? Okay, whatever. Okay, so fine. If you if no one does it, if no one knows the answer to this question, um, I can explain it, but. I would like greatly suggest, I would say for everyone, if you're part of this reading club, the purpose of this reading club is to learn and to participate. And there might be some problems if for some reason you don't know the question we're on, or you for some reason can't answer a question. Mm. Anyways, as I said before, the main reason of the this reading club is to like learn to participate. Um so uh I think I have an answer. Oh yeah, um okay, you're welcome to share. Mm -hmm. People are used to complex things like furniture and tables, and they see them every day. So they're used to recognizing them. And like basic shapes, like rectangles, we don't see those every day. So our brains are not used to recognizing them. 
which means we have a much smaller part of our brain dedicated to recognizing like rectangles. So it takes us longer, even though there's infrared. Okay, that's somewhat close. Um, um, Isabella, do you have another answer? Yeah, so I was thinking about it and I decided that I feel like some people are more exposed to different like objects. It's not like every single day where a person touches like a star or like a circle or something like that. It's more like we see a bunch of pens in a cup and then like a messy desk and then a chair with a jacket hung over it. So we recognize more like complex things, kind of like what Oliver said. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um that's generally um um kind of the reason. Um the reason that um people take less time to recognize more complex um scenes and to recognize basic shapes is because vision also works like a kind um also works for like experience. Like um people have more experience um with um like like looking at large um um scenes or, or like detailed pictures in their own daily life. So um they like so um when they're like looking like um seeing like a complex scene like the one um like someone like something they've already seen before um they can like bypass the hierarchy you we uh, mentioned before like they don't have to like go through so much complex steps like the only experience and knowledge like recognizes that image kind of so it's like quicker like sometimes it's even quicker than to recognize like basic shapes because they've seen it before and they're relying on like their um ex experiences yeah So, um, okay, uh, now let's go on to question number three. Um, what is, we can skip question number four and some other questions. Um, also, by the end of this reading club, um, everyone, I will assign everyone like a chapter in the next book we're reading. Um, they will be in charge of like making questions for that chapter, uh, making discussion questions, hosting that chapter or two chapters. Um, we're a little bit shorter than people here. Um, more than I, uh, we have less people than I was originally expecting. Um, but that's okay. Um, everyone can take on like maybe slightly more chapters. Um, and I. Um, later on in the hope in the other like cooperation for meetings, I can also ask members to to um who are part of the reading club to be in charge of those chapters too. So make sure you're staying to the end of like this meeting. Okay, so actually yeah, let's skip question number three and four. Okay, now let's move on to um, um, another question. So what is the author on um, Feifei's reasoning behind creating ImageNet? Does anyone remember? Again, besides vision, this subject is also like heavily covered in this book. So um, I'm sure like you can find like some, um, some like, texts or um answers um in the book so does anyone like remember any of the reasoning behind creating ImageNet? okay 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 let me stop here does anyone know what ImageNet is okay you can just blurt the answer out if you know is it like uh, computer vision. It was the massive database of labeled images in thousands of categories. Yeah, excellent. Um, Oliver, 
also like just like side comment like i don't really expect anyone to know this but does anyone know how many categories there were of like pictures okay i think there was about twenty two thousand. dollars but so now that like Yes, ImageNet is kind of connected to computer version, kind of. So, um, this it's not that you guys know what ImageNet is, so you guys should know um the author's reasoning behind creating it, right? Not that she suddenly hopped out of bed one day and decided to take on a task that would take one to two years, and and create a massive database of pictures. Oh yeah, Isabella, you're leaving at eight, right? Mm, yeah. Okay, so why yo? I'm gonna give you guys some actually a lot of time sc scanning your books, um, for image for what image that was and her reasoning behind creating it, um, and you should find plenty of material on that. Um, anyways, let's go on like to spreadsheets for um our next book. So, uh, so the next book we're reading is this book. It's called The Pursuit of Happiness. It's a real, it's a really inspirational story. This isn't about AI. Um, after all, sometimes AI can be a little bit too complex for you guys to understand. Uh, maybe, but um, it's like a really inspirational story. It's like an autobiography of this guy called Chris Gardner. Um, this black guy. He was. 
very like very poor like at one time he was living in like homeless shelters um and like sleeping in public restrooms so um like he was like very poor but he became fascinated when he was an adult by um a prestigious investing firm so he worked like really hard like even reading in the middle of the night um investment box in a public restroom um evidently he had a lot of self-motivation so like we can definitely learn a lot from his story like he like worked really hard um like juggling like, works and like reading like investing books accumulating knowledge um and in the end it paid off well like he he like um got into like an investing firm became a stockbroker um and like a very powerful um like a very influential investor too so and after like he um got like a lot of money and he got and he became rich basically he donated a lot of his money to like different homeless shelters um for the poor um different like um um charities and organizations so we can definitely learn a lot of him of his story from his like self-motivation and like persistence determination to his like um in the end like he could just have turned his back on all of those homeless shelters and stuff but he instead chose to donate a very large portion of his money to those charitable organizations so that's like a really inspirational story um anyways so let's see um this including myself um and soon zang there's five people um right now okay um in this book there's 12 chapters so everyone should have should be assigned at least one chapter um and again this is like to enhance your learning um hopefully like if you um are making like problems you probably um like you know a lot more about the um about the content in the book and it's like much better for um a better like learning experience okay so who wants to start first um isabella since you're leaving you'll be leaving first um do you have like a select like chapter you want to cover i can cover too um if it comes to that Okay, um, can I do The World Beyond and Pictures of a Life? Okay. Done. Okay. Um, that's great then. So you should have this book already. If not, make sure to buy it. It's by Chris Gardner with Quincy Troop. Um, a very good and influential book, as I've said before. Um, but yeah, okay. The, um, who next? Oliver, um, you can be in charge of one to two books, um, of one to two chapters, but like make sure you'll be there next meeting, though. Okay, so Oliver, do you have like a particular, particular chapters you want, like chapter one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve? I don't really care about what chapter I get. Mm. I don't have a preference. Okay, then I'll um give you two chapters then. Um are you sure you can handle two chapters? Okay. Um how about one? Okay, so I'll give you, um, these two chapters, okay? Okay. Um, Cindy, um, also, I don't think I've seen you that much before in previous meetings, um, so are you just starting just now? are you have you like started um in our book club just reading club just now 
um, or have you been here? Sorry, my memory can be pretty bad sometimes. So anyways, um, can you like unmute, um, start your video, I prefer. Um, so which chapter would you like? Um, Olivia, can I leave now? Sure. Okay. Thank Wait, you. Um, mm -hmm. thanks for attending this meeting. Mm -hmm. Or just wake up. Okay. So Cindy left. Okay. Um, Kai. Uh, which chapters do you want? I don't care. Uh. Oh, do you want two or three? Huh? Do you want two chapters or three chapters? I'll take two chapters. Okay. So which ones do you want then? Uh, I can do... Um, I don't know. Maybe this then. Okay. Uh Actually, you know what? Since this is A and B, maybe you can do this. Then. Whatever. Who cares? Um. So. Okay. Is anyone else here, Daniel? Yeah. Okay. Right now, we're choosing like um, we're assign we're being assigned like um, everyone is getting to be assigned like two chapters or more if you want. Hopefully, um, like to like, um, like to like um, make like discussion problems for each chapter. Um, so here is the pursuit of happiness. This is the next book we're reading. It's by Chris Gardner, a very inspirational book. Um. Wait, so we have to choose two chapters? Huh? We have to choose two chapters? Yeah. Oh, yeah, is Chloe there? Uh, no, she, she has class. Oh, okay. So you can choose two chapters. Which chapter? Or one. Um, wait, uh, I'll choose chapter six. Six? Oh, Isabella already chose, chose that. I'll choose chapter eight. Uh, oh yeah, but this is like two parts though, so it would be better if you have like two chapters. Okay, now take chapter nine. Chapter eight and chapter nine are together. Oh, okay, now I'll just take chapter, wait, it's ch what chapters are, are they? Chapter three, chapter nine, eight and nine, chapter ten, chapter okay, nine. I'll take three and ten. Okay. Okay. I'll do roses in the get. Audrey, okay. I'll do Roses in the Ghetto and Sphere of Influence. Okay. Okay, now I'll do these two chapters then. If no one wants to do them. Okay. Also, hold on. Okay, so now we're done with this. Um, actually, our meeting is about time. Actually, it's supposed to be one hour. Um, we have a few more questions. Um, if um anyone wants to like um do them. Also, Daniel, I would greatly 
um, I would recommend you arrive on time next time because um, you arrive just about when we're um, when officially we're supposed to end the meeting. So I don't know um, if you would gain a lot of like like knowledge or like learning um, from that from like arriving like around the end of the class or of like the meeting or like the reading club. But next time, um, you should arrive at like the correct time at seven o'clock, which is when the the reading club is supposed to start. Um, okay. So does anyone have to go anywhere? Okay, since um after all um none of you recently um seem to be in the mood for sharing that much, um we can just end this meeting then. Um thank you all for coming at least. Um and see you um next meeting.